Hey everyone, Action Movie Dad here, and you're looking great today. It's been a while since our last Cheap Tricks, and let me just say, I've missed you too. Today we're going to take a look at some techniques for bringing some inanimate objects to life. Now, as a shy show-off, the first thing I ever wanted to be professionally was a puppeteer. I love bringing things to life, and I love having a tiny bit of a buffer between me and an audience. As I've uh, matured, I still daydream, lots, and my friends will tell you that I'm constantly distracted from real life by pretend life. And especially with my ADHD, it's easy to immerse myself in an Amelie-esque Walter Mittyverse of madness. And the closest thing I do to an art is that I impulsively make videos of things that are the way that I see them in my head using visual effects. When it comes to imagining that life could be more, inspiration comes from everywhere. And the worst part of just being one person is that you can never do it all yourself. Not only that, but I love teaching people everything I can, and there's just not enough time. I need more of me, like, like a team, like a knowledgeable team that could, well, I'm rambling now, signature quality of a cheap tricks. Anyway, well, what are the steps to creating a fun little magical moment like this? Well, we've got to get inspired. We've got to film our plate. We've got to remove the objects. We've got to create models, animate those models, and then composite them in. Step one is to get inspired. And for me, this is basically just taking a walk anywhere I'm at, and I'll see four dozen things that would make for a fun little exercise in visual effects. Or, uh, or vfx exercise, as I like to call it. I don't call them that. It doesn't doesn't read well. Maybe with a, with a Z. No, nope, I hate it. But I love seeing creative statues and sculptures whenever I walk around a new place. And it's a great jumping off point for a neat little shot. This year, Maxon was able to hold its first big company meeting in years. After merging with Red Giant over two years ago, it's the first time I actually got to meet a bunch of the people that I work with in person. We met in Bad Homburg, Germany, which is not only the official home of Maxon headquarters, but a stunning place to walk around. Inspiration? Check. In addition to stuff that I just found pretty and wanted to capture, I also couldn't resist filming potential plates for VFX shots. Which brings me to the filming plates stage. Your particular style may differ, but my filming style is actually very informed by a combination of what I think will be a good shot, and what will motion track well if I'm going to add 3D assets to later. Which means you'll want some clear parallax and plenty of texture or detail for a motion tracker to grab onto. Orbiting a statue, for example, means that I'll likely get a good camera track, and I'll have the information of what's behind this statue to help with the in-painting later. Now, if you're there in person, you might as well grab a few other stills of what appears behind your object. These may be helpful to stitch together and place in 3D later if you need. And if you want to get fancy, grab a 360 degree panorama of your location to use for lighting and reflections later. I use an app called 360 by Occipital. And heck, if you need them, get a bunch of photos of the characters you're about to animate. And I mention all these steps because they'll really help you out. And in typical Hashi fashion, I got none of this. Why? Have you no decency? Have you no respect for the person fixing this in post? Well, okay, he hear me out. Uh, for these spontaneous moments, filmed on a mobile phone, some of the best sampled empty plates come from the actual take itself. A reflection map, well, luckily the asset browser in Cinema 4D actually has a handful of HDRI maps, including this one that's stupidly close. And since nothing I'm animating is super reflective, it just needs to be about right. And once I decided to use this particular take, I threw it into After Effects to do some camera tracking. Now, I've already done some videos specifically on tracking, and you're probably familiar with them if you're here. But if not, please do check out this one. I don't like to toot my own horn, but this one is actually a really, really useful video that includes our free normalized track script, which I consider essential to my After Effects workflow. With the help of this script, basically you just run a track camera, once it's done, you can establish a floor or a wall plane, and then click on this button. And now, everything is at the proper default center of your 3D space, and it has a comp perfect scale. All right, so you've perfectly tracked your scene now, but we can't just go in adding stuff yet. There's all these real stationary statues in the way. 
And here's where I call on the talents of my lovely assistant and definitely real person, Content Aware Phil. Phil, tell them what you do. Hey Hashi. Well, I can be very useful for removing objects from your scene, but it helps a lot if you know the way I work. Please explain. Sure. Most people know that I look for the holes you've punched in your footage and try to fill those in, but you can get really mixed results depending on what I have to start with. When you click on Generate Fill Layer, the first thing I do is analyze your footage. During this time, I'm trying to create motion vectors, literally getting a feel for the flow of your footage. Oh, cool. Once I establish this little flow pattern, I use it as a way to search across time to see if hidden parts of the background are visible during other parts of the clip. This is why I'm really good at removing an object moving across a relatively stationary background, or removing a stationary object moving across a background. Tracking shot of a person walking down the street? No problem. For an orbital shot like this, you may instinctively try erasing the statues, like this, and feeding it to me. Well, although it is what you want me to replace, when I analyze your footage, this is going to be the motion pattern that I see. When I go to fill in this hole, it's going to be confusing interpreting what vectors I should be respecting. So I'm going to end up giving you a result like this. Yeah, that looks dumb. Yeah, but it's your fault, not mine. You'd actually be better blocking off the entire middle object. That way, I'll guess the motion vectors look like this, and I'll do a better job at filling in this section. Also, when you fed me this plate earlier, you're using planes from your 3D track with simple masks to preserve this pedestal. So all you have to do now is pop the pedestal back on. That's honestly a pretty awesome result. I mean, especially considering that, for the most part, the 3D camera tracker and you are doing the majority of this work at the press of a button. And I don't even mind the slight wonkiness because I'm gonna put a bunch of animated stuff right there, and I bet it ends up looking pretty great. Especially for something shot improvisationally on the spot and trying to make it work quickly. So thanks so much for your help, Phil. Anytime, Hashi. I'm always a click away. All right, so, Bam, we've removed our object. Now we've got to create some models. And, well, really, I mean finding some models to modify, or, you know, mods to mod, as we industry people call them that. Literally, no one has ever said that. Oh, Phil, you're still on. Uh, well, let me just, uh... Right, okay, so, uh, replacing models. Remember, we're in quick video mode, so I don't want this to be a very long process. In the spirit of working quickly, I don't even need to make this all that accurate. I'm not animating a famous statue in this case. And honestly, if it's a super famous statue, someone's probably already 3D modeled it. Today I'm working with this relatively obscure fountain, as far as most people are concerned. And honestly, even though I've shown it a bunch of times in this video already, I bet even you don't remember the details, but would be fine if they're, you know, close enough. It's like the same principle behind this magic trick where you pick one of these cards and then I'm gonna use magic to make just your card disappear. Magic. Totally relevant. Memory is mushy is all I'm saying, and I'll bet that most of you remember what I remember about this fountain. There are definitely children holding up lanterns on sticks, kind of. There's a mix of boys and girls at different heights and poses, maybe four or five of them. Let's just start with a girl and a boy, and then we'll scale them differently. For the modeling, I'm gonna work in Cinema 4D. And there's a very convenient place to start your look for models, which is the Asset Browser right here. Here, I'll type in Child. And looky here, here's one holding a balloon. That could be helpful. And oh man, look at this. It's an old school zygote model made up of all the little parts. Now, I plan to Mixamo animate this later, so I need a T-pose. And luckily, my friend Darren was sitting next to me at the time and whispered, you could try unfolding all. Select everything, and then set all the rotation values to zero. And that's why I like sitting next to Darren, because he knows more about this program than I do. And it's good to have access to people like that. I wonder how he's doing. Anyway, now that I've got my T-pose, I'll export this as an FBX so I can send it to Mixamo. Now, I didn't see a model I liked for the girl, so I'm going to run the Sketchfab Importer tool, which is available for free if you just search for Cinema 4D Sketchfab Importer. And in here, I found a few models that I'm gonna combine. First is this woman with a leather belt by O. Che. And then this talking Tina model by Art of Ant? Artofant? Artofant. 
I'll steal the pigtails from this model and then I'll paste them here. And now looking at her, I actually want to lengthen this skirt to make it look more old fashioned. Now this model was all baked as one piece of geometry. So to lengthen the skirt, I need to jump into point mode, grab a handful of points from this dress selection, and then I'll press UW to try to select the connected points. Now in a front view, I'll deselect some of the portions of the top of the dress here, adjust my axis point up to here, and that way I can scale these points of the dress down. I mean, nothing fancy. It's all gonna get textured like a bronze statue anyway. Now, lastly, there's an awful lot of geometry in here for a model that I'm planning to send to Mixamo. So I'm probably gonna stick this body in a polygon reduction object so I can get a much more optimized Mixamo kind of object. There we go. So on to animation. Next is a step most of us are probably familiar with if you watch my videos, and that's Mixamo.com. Mixamo is a web-based place to load any human morphotype and use this very simple process to auto-rig a model so you can apply motions from this large library of motion capture files. And since I know that these children are supposed to be holding lanterns, I found these torch-related actions that all seem to work pretty well. Once I had the action I want to download for each of my characters, I download the resulting FBX file and then can load it back into Cinema. You'll see the model comes in along with an awesome Mixamo skeleton. And now that I'm here, I just need to twirl open the hierarchy, find the proper hand, and start placing these little lanterns uh, right into the hand object. And then I can probably attach something that, you know, like dangles dynamically. Uh, only problem is I have no idea how to do that. Oh, well, uh, I could help. Jonas, Jonas Pills, hey. extra trainer, it's you. Oh, I'm so glad hey, you're what's here. Up, um, I am trying to dangle one object off of an already moving object. Is Can you help me out? Uh, I can do that. Thank I can you. do that. Uh, your action movie Pills is here for you. Yes. Right. So here we have a simple scene with just some primitives. And if I press play, you can see that this top bit is moving. I want to hang this lantern and uh, this connector thing onto this top piece here. So first of all, what I need to do is I select all of them and I go to bullet tags and rigid body. So I add rigid body tags to them. Okay. Um, for the handle, I'm gonna select the tag and I'm gonna switch off dynamic, which will basically make it a collider. So now I have these three tags here, one collider and two rigid body tags. And now when I press play, you can see that these objects are falling down, right? So I somehow need to connect them to the handle. So I need to connect the connector to the handle and I need to connect the cylinder, which is the lantern, to the connector. And there's a way how you can do that. And if you go to the simulate menu and then to the bullet submenu, there is an object called connector. So we create a connector, we place it somewhere in our scene and now we need to find the right type. By default, it's set to hinge, but you can also set it to rectal, and this is exactly what we need here. So I set it to rectal, and then I'm going to move it up because the axis of this object needs to be exactly where we want the rotation point to be. So let's put it here, and let's also rotate it so that this gizmo here is pointing downwards because these are our limits so to speak so if i select the connector you can see that the cone radius is changing when i'm adjusting the slider here and now i need to connect these two objects simply by putting them into the link fields so i start with the handle as object a and then i use the connector here as object b right and now everything i need to do is i create a copy of this thing and yeah, let me let me throw out these two objects here. And I'm gonna move it down to the other point where, well, the other point of rotation, like so. And this time I'm going to select it again and object A is gonna be the connector and object B is gonna be the cylinder. And now it should already work somehow. So let me press play. Yeah, you can see that it is working, but there is a lot of 
springiness in here, if that's even a word. So what you can do is you can go to edit and project settings. And well, typically this is the default here, but when you go to bullet settings, um, there's a tab called expert. And what you need to do in order to get rid of the springiness here is you need to bring up the steps per frame and the maximum solve iterations per frame. So let me just go with 20 and 40 or so. And now you can see that it's way more stable. Of course, we can bring this up even more, but this is how you would do it with bullet dynamics and with the connector objects. Oh my gosh, that's perfect. Excellent. Oh, thank you so much for being available, Jonas. This is great. Absolutely no problem. Hey, Hashi, Jonas. Darren. Hey, Darren. Darren Frank, What's up? Other master trainer. Well, How's it too, going, man? Guys, that's a really cool example. I have an idea, though, of how we can do this with rope, with the new rope in Cinema 4D26. So instead of using a cylinder here, I'm actually going to use rope. So I have a spline already set up. So what I want to do with the spline is make it rope. Okay. And then I want to actually take a part of this rope and belt it to this cube on the top. So I'll go to point mode. I'll select the point that I want to belt and then say the object we're belting onto is a cube. I'll set that belt in place and then on this cube, which is the one hanging on the bottom, I'm going to make it cloth. And so it's all staying in the same, uh, the, the new dynamic system. And then I use a connector to connect this cube to the rope. So I need to turn up the search radius until I see something here. Let's try 50, one fit. There we go. So these yellow lines show me there's a connector. And now let's see if I got everything set up when I press play, we can see that Whoa. it's hanging, it's connected. Oh, this think? is cool. Oh, that's so great. That is amazing. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. I like both of these solutions. I'm going to implement both of them into my model. Actually. Thank you so much, Jonas. Thank you so much, Darren. This is amazing. You're welcome. All right. Take care, everyone. Cool. Bye. Bye. Wow. It's really nice to have experienced artists teach you things. I'll take Jonas's advice and apply this bullet dynamics rig to hang a lantern from this file. And then I'll use the setup that Darren showed me for simulating a dynamic rope for this fish casting kind of action. Using the new dynamic systems in R26, Darren set up this project to use a rope connected to this cloth box. I wanted a slightly more intricate model of a lantern hanging from the bottom of this rope. And Darren recommended against turning this object into cloth, which would be very heavy on the computer, and instead adding a mesh deformer to this lantern and using that initial simple box as the cage. And now I get the best of both worlds. Now play that back and we've got our two animated characters. And I'm gonna fall back on my easy Hashi style use of After Effects and Element 3D as a shortcut to my final. I'll take each project and export an OBJ sequence by going to File, Export OBJ, then in the Animation tab, making sure that I check Export All Frames. Once I've done that for both, I can hop over into After Effects, where you'll recall we've got our 3D tracked scene with the background erased. Since I used that normalized script earlier, this is all prepped for me just to drop in a new solid, add element, and then import my 3D sequences. With the model selected, I scroll down to alignment and select bottom to make sure that the model is standing right on the ground. Next, I'll apply a pre-made bronze texture to these and also hopping back into Cinema 4D for a second, I'll look up that HDRI file that worked perfectly from the Cinema 4D asset library. I'll download this and then use this same file as my environment in Element. Now again, basically for time, I'll just make two copies of my girl and two copies of the boy in separate group folders, and then I'll hop back out where I can see my models. I create a controller null for each of them. And now I can position and scale them to be right on this pedestal 
generally facing out, and then I open up the frame offset amount to kind of offset these movements in a way that there's some variety and some well-timed ducking and posturing. With a slight scale difference and the offset time, I think that this is the right vibe of what I remember this fountain feeling like, only more alive. Now for a couple last things that'll make this look better. Now I cover these in a handful of other videos, but here are the basics. Let's twirl down these render options and enable ambient occlusion and turn that up and so we get some nice soft, you know, defining self-shadowing going on. Also, it would be helpful to have some directional light up here that casts similar shadows to the original footage. And maybe a touch of ambient lighting just to match the dark levels a bit. Play it all back and you've got a pretty cool moment brought to life. A little bit of compositing magic. I see several things a day that I want to bring to life just like this, and my phone is full of improvised plates for VFX shots that I've imagined spontaneously. That means that I pull out my phone, film something I want to animate later, and likely have to keep walking to wherever I was already headed. I don't usually have the time to grab an environment plate or reference photos. I mean, basically condemning my future self to all the cheats that we had to use today. You know, one single take, no models, no HDRI, no background plates. But as I always say, when life gives you lemons, fix them in post. I have a very specific knowledge base that I put to use in most of my videos, but what happens when I don't know how to do something? In fact, I didn't know how to do a few of the things for this video, and was lucky enough to get to turn to some much more experienced Cinema 4D artists to get help, because help is cool. And I'm here to offer as much help as I can to you. You can always ask me anything online, and I'm also live two hours every Friday here on this channel where you can ask me or Seth Worley or Michael Zalapsky anything, and we'll literally answer and demonstrate right there. Now, real talk, I wasn't sure what was gonna happen when Red Giant and Maxon merged, and there have certainly been some growing pains, but as we've put our heads together recently, some really great things have started emerging. I get to do a live show every week with my best friends about pretty much anything we want. I've made new, talented friends, and I'm really excited to be part of a team that can probably answer any 3D visual effects workflow question you can think of. So please also subscribe to the Maxon Training Team channel. Now, I'm bad at Cinema 4D, but these folks are great at it. I'm terrified of Redshift, but Ellie Wade is a wizard at it and definitely not a synthetic person. I'm colorblind, but we've got Max, who will teach you all about our color tools, and Chad is one of the humblest people you'll ever meet, who also knows way more than you do about these tools. And don't forget Dr. Sassy, who once built some CAD software out of a coconut, I'm pretty sure. And of course, the nose man. Well, nose. Now, right now, we're all hard at work trying to get this knowledge to you through our free live shows every weekday, shorter tutorials, and even 30-second quick tips to jumpstart your creativity. And yes, I'm shilling right now, because to be honest, all of our tutorials and live shows really improve with your participation. So join us live when you can, and ask questions. And if you can't join us live, leave comments afterward, and find us online and ask anytime. In fact, this Cheap Tricks episode only exists because of a question asked live that led to a fun discussion about working fast with limited time and resources. Um, any questions for Hershey? How did you do that? <laughs> Damn it. Do that one. We love answering your questions almost as much as we love seeing your work. So please, find us, follow us, and bombard us with your questions and accomplishments. Make your action movie dad proud. I love you all, and I'll see you Friday at 10 Pacific.